Okay, Todd, if you have to place a bet, because we're going to talk about betting today, do you use DraftKings, FanDuel, BetMGM? What's your betting method of choice? Bruiser, the bookie from down the street. <laughs> That's what it used to be way back when. Do you use any of these? No. Okay. But we're going to talk about why in a second. Okay, so you have like a reason. Did you ever use them? Uh, yes. All right, let's Here. go. Do, 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 do. Here we go. My name's Todd. And this is Kathy. Welcome back to another episode of Zen Parenting Radio. This is podcast number 750, which is a um, very round number, 750. We're three quarters of the way to 1,000, sweet. Yikes. So if we do this for another, I don't know, four years, we'll get to 1,000. Or if we do a show every day. We'll get there faster. Every day it's a getting closer, going faster than a roller coaster. Favorite roller coaster. Go, sweetie. Uh, old school, it's the demon from Great America because that was my favorite when I was young. Now, I would say I really liked that um, Hulk one that we did. Oh, my God. The Hulk one was good. I don't remember. I think there's a Universal Florida. Um, it like shoots you out. Quick story about Kathy. Um, we were probably not even married and we went to Kings Island or, mm -hmm. or Cedar Point in Ohio. I forget which one it was. And um, you told me you were scared of roller coasters, but you decided to go anyways on the roller coaster. And I've never sat next to somebody <laughs> who honestly was terrified. I've been with people that scream because it's fun. Yeah. You were screaming because it was not fun. Because that one wasn't fun. It was the beast. You were really... There was no place to put my feet. You were really scared. Yes. That, isn't that the point? Yeah. I just... I'm like, oh, I get, I've, it's always been fun for me. Oh, uh, yeah. Being next to somebody who screams, but they're kind of screaming through play or screaming through, I know I'm going to be all right. You were screaming as if to say... I'm not going to be all right. Right. I didn't think I was going to be all right. And you it turns out you were. Yeah, I'm still here. Um, I think that I go on roller coasters. Oh, hello. Boop, boop, boop. Um, I go on roller coasters, uh, I'd say three-fourths of the time, meaning like if I'm somewhere. I like some of them. I just think some of them, it's just not worth my energy because it's too scary. Yeah. And I don't, I don't need to do that. You know, I think people do, it, it's going to kind of connect with what we're talking about today because, you know, um, I think part of the reason people do roller coasters is to feel alive and to feel scared. And I already feel pretty alive, so I don't want to do it. Um. Yes. And we are going to talk about that. I'm first going to throw you a curveball. Okay. I was on a walk with some friends of mine this weekend. Okay. And there was a man who I know relatively well. He was talking about empathy, uh -huh. but he was kind of talking about it as if it was, he said something like too, too much empathy is a bad thing. Oh yeah. That there's a take people and, have. And that's new for me. I really? Yeah. I didn't I, I I'm like empathy is good because you can walk through the world in a different person's shoes and you can see the world from their vantage point, which gives you the ability to connect with them more deeply. And the scenario he gave was there was an illness in the family, and his wife is super duper empathic to the point where she's debilitated. Uh, because she's thinking about what well, then see empathy necessitates boundaries. And so what he's talking about, there's no boundaries there. That's compassion fatigue. Right. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just want to have a quick discussion about that because it threw me off. I'm like, no, no, empathy is good. He's like, yes. And it can also too much of it can be really bad. Of course, everything in life is that right. I'm actually attempting right now to write something about how, you know, finding that uh, understanding that there's nothing that is entirely good and there's nothing that's entirely bad. Like there, there's always this place of understanding between. Um, and the thing why I say that about I'm surprised you haven't heard that is because um, this See, was, there's a lot of things I haven't heard that you'd be surprised. Well, it, several years ago, I'm talking maybe possibly eight to 10 years ago when Brene Brown came out with her first book or second book uh, and she talked about empathy. Um, Adam Grant came back with a too much empathy is bad thing. Mm -hmm. Like he always has this deep data, you know, thinker take on things. Yeah. And she came back and was like, uh, 
you know, I, I don't agree with you. Like there was kind of a back and forth about it. And that's because sometimes just the definition of empathy, we think empathy means I can feel what other people are feeling, period. Therefore, it's bad because, you know, the examples that were given, like you don't want a surgeon feeling the way a patient does or else that surgeon can't do their job. Well, of course not. And there's boundaries there depending on what your role is in any kind of interaction with somebody. As a parent, I have to make choices with my children. I can still understand how they are feeling and maybe even feel it if I'm real spongy, but it doesn't mean that I am always going to, um, you know, not follow through with something that I know is best for them because I'm feeling them like you, I have boundaries or I have an understanding of my role. Yeah. And so I think it's the same. I struggle with this. So <laughs> the experience that his wife had, I struggle with this, but I don't think to myself, man, I wish that I wasn't an empathetic person. What it is, is what I realize I have to do is be conscious of where I am and get rest and separate and and pay attention to compassion fatigue. And this could be, um, it's just a hasty generalization, but because I surround myself with men, I'm always challenged, one, for me to practice my own empathy muscle. Uh-huh. And to to get other guys to do the same, so I think that's why I was kind of thrown off a little bit. Like, no, 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 no. We like we need to work on this. And I judge that we, generally speaking, men in general, need to develop that empathy muscle more than our female counterparts. I agree, and I think the first thing is to define what empathy means. Let's do. That. And empathy necessitates boundaries. Okay, so like that's a big part of it. For example, I am going to be a lot more empathetic. Um, with other people, if I have my own understanding of my needs, yeah. if I am just this open, bleeding heart um, and I'm feeling everybody else's feelings and I have been in that position before where, and that's my, you know, that's something I've had to work on, then I'm going to be resentful of other people. Yeah. Then I'm going to feel like I, and, and I, and I have this sometimes where I'm so de or depleted that I will say to you, I can't be with other people right now because I will take in their experiences or I will feel the need to take care of them. And that is going to deplete me even more. Yeah. So the definition of empathy necessitates having that word boundary in there. So you can show up for people. So it's just like anything else. The right. answer is somewhere in the middle. And for some reason, I'm thinking of Terry Reel's relationship grid, and we don't have to get into it, but on the horizontal axis is boundaries. Right. And on the left, it's boundary less, which Correct. means there are no boundaries right. and you're love dependent. Right. That's the term. He, and then on the right is walled off. And I think that most of us guys fall into the walled off category more than the love dependent. Of course, there's exceptions to the rule, but- uh, for me, and you know, the answer is for like, cause you are probably sometimes that don't have enough boundaries, Correct. whereas I've probably over compartmentalized stuff. Exactly. And, and the I, answer is for us to find our way towards each other in the middle. Exactly. And I think people like research or like something that makes them feel better about the way that they respond to things. And if we tend to look at a woman who feels overwhelmed by someone in her family who is sick or a, or a child who has some, you know, special needs in that moment or overall, or, you know, if they have a dying parent and, and they're feeling overwhelmed, like, first of all, there are, there, this gets messy because there are moments in time when feeling overwhelmed is very normal. Like, you know, we're not always going to be stoic and static <laughs> where it's like, we got this together. I've got my boundaries in place. Sometimes it's overwhelming. And he's talking about his wife felt overwhelmed because someone was sick. And sometimes that's just called being human. Yeah. And we don't have to be like, you know what? She did it wrong. Or, or you know what? I'm not going to care as much yeah. because I'm going to have that experience. It's this experience of when she starts to realize, like I, you know, we've, you and I have been in that position where if you, you know, if I was taking care of my mom or my dad or one of our kids and things were really heavy, we knew that when we started to be like, oh, you know, like I'm starting to feel resentful or I'm starting to feel overwhelmed or sad that we needed yeah. a break for ourselves. And so sometimes that feeling of over overwhelm is an indicator. Yeah. But it's not always like that. What do you that. think gets in the way? Let's uh, let me pick on, um, you know, you or okay. his wife. Mm hmm. What gets in the way from you setting that boundary? 
Because I have been, um, th there's a few things there. I have been culturally and societally trained to be a, a caregiver and that it's my role or something that I've developed that strong muscle over time, just because of the generation I grew up in and being female and I have learned how to care for people. So it's like something I know how to do. Right. And so that's part of the problem. I think also just who I am, who I came in the world as, um, and that could be because of my childhood experiences, or it just could be the soul that I came in as who knows. I care about people a lot. I concern myself a lot of what people are feeling. So I've got, you know, a bit of a double whammy there. Yeah. Um, and that is a, I love both of those things. I love both of those things about me, but I have to be, you know, I have a lot of, um, what are they called? Tools yeah. that I use because I've seen how it, it has impacted me negatively. Well, and you're welcome to turn the tables on me, but I want to ask you two more questions sure. about you being overly empathic sometimes. Okay. What do you get out of it? And then what is the cost of it? Um, well, what I get out of it is a sense of where it feels normal to me. So it's like I feel like um, I'm not having to – it's it's a natural flow for me. It's kind of like when you go towards something that seems to be like – it's a very worn neural pathway in my brain. It's like here's what I do. I take care of you. Here's what I do. I say the right thing. Here's what I do. I, you know, call you and hold you up. And that makes you feel connected and and that you are serving and you, you, there's. The it feels love. very natural. Right. And yes, of course I yeah. get things from it. I get someone's love. I get a sense of worth. And it also just is what I know. Yeah. So it's like, there's a few things going on. And then what was the last question? What is. What's the cost? Well, because then I don't focus as much on myself right. and I don't know what um, I need all yeah, the time. You get overwhelmed and tired. And also resentful of people who don't do that amount yeah. of caregiving. I think that um, it, it is something that we need to work on in a gender yeah. um, way because yeah. I I feel very frustrated, you know, uh, with you because you're the only guy in my family currently that I'm living with, um, is that I am frustrated with you that you often uh, will wake up and think about you. Yeah. And you don't think about everybody else. Yeah. And while there, that is good, meaning like I try to make that practice, you know, wake up and think about what I need, or I talk to women about taking care of themselves, but sometimes it can be too skewed yeah. to where you are going into that path of, I don't want to be too empathetic, or I don't need to think about you guys. You guys take care of yourselves. Yeah. And that's not really the, the, on the deep understanding, we could get into lots of, um, you know, data here. But we have a, a huge unpaid workforce in our country, and that's women. Yeah. Like, we do a lot of things that nobody pays us for, and everybody's like, that's just what you do. And you take care of people, and you, you know, you help people when they're sick, and you take care of kids when they're not in school, and you, you know, down, you, you have a part-time job instead of a full-time job. Like, we are, tend to be, I'm talking data here, I'm generalizing, you know, we have unpaid jobs. And so sometimes you know, the experience of like, it would be nice if men were doing the same kind of thing because we balance out. So in other words, it may, it would make it easier for you. Yes. If I moved over towards the middle, because then you would be able to move over towards the middle Correct. with me. So yes. you could start doing your own version of compartmentalization and doing your own version of self-care. But, but yeah. in order to do that, I need to create the space for that. I pick up whatever slack may have been missed because you begin compartmentalizing and taking care of yourself. Does that yeah, make sense? You, if you pay attention to other people, yeah, um, that you can. Then yeah. I can pay attention more to me, and then you can have the experience and the joy of what it feels like to yeah. care for other people. Because it's not this is not a one way experience of you just need to come up and do more work. This yeah. is a you're missing something well, important. And the example I, I get is like the place where I'm. The, one of the very few places I care more than Kathy does, or maybe you'll disagree with me, is around water, bodies of water with our kids in the ocean. Like I get all jacked up, like yeah. my nerve, because I've had all these close calls and all that. And it's not like you're complacent, but you're just like a normal human being. And I'm like- Are you talking about the ocean? Yeah. Oh my God, honey, I'm a mess at the ocean. I, what are you talking about? I feel like when it comes to undertoes and things like that. My God, you and I are not a good team in that matter. I am, okay, this I is- I think we're both, I think I am also 
really that's what basic. i mean yeah we are not a good we don't have a good balance there's no balance i often do not go down to the beach with all of you even with my adult children because it's so stressful for me do you remember when i would say i, I feel like this is a weird conversation because i feel like you used to be annoyed at me when the girls were little and i and i still yell to my 20 year old come closer yeah. come in i am and why it makes me so sad is as a kid, I wasn't terrified of the ocean. Yeah. So I have this like baseline of I used to play in the ocean, no problem. Yes, I got pulled in by an undertow and yeah. I've had all those bad experiences, but I also was not afraid. I had a childhood experience of enjoying it. But as a parent, I think you learn about people who drown and Todd's had some near drowning experiences and you're thinking about your children. They can't. Right. <laughs> I'm not afraid of sharks. Are you afraid of sharks? No, not I'm all. not either. And that's weird because I think a lot of people, that's why they don't like the ocean. That's not me. I don't like the ocean because it's unpredictable. No kidding. And my kids can feel as if they're in control. And then all of a sudden it gets darker and the tide turns yeah. and the, you know, like I get frustrated on trips because people know people, meaning my family knows that I, I'm a little uptight about water, less about swimming pools, more about ocean. And that sometimes there'll be a flag out saying, don't go in the water. Mm -hmm. And then one of my girls would be like, it's fine. I'm like, it's not. There's a flag saying, don't, why well, would someone flag, put that out? We don't go in when the flag says don't go in. The, we'll, we'll go in when it's like, hey, it's choppy, so be careful. Yeah. But there's also a flag that's like, nobody's allowed in. Right. So we might go in there when they're like, oh, be careful, it's choppy. Yeah. And, and I'm not really super afraid of lakes mm -hmm. either. I feel like they're pretty smooth and I, you know, again, grew up by a lake. So that to me, it's the ocean. Yeah. The ocean is like a living, everything's living, but do you agree with me on this? The power of the ocean is, uh, it's just amazing. It, yeah. It's it what scares, I love the most. Scares a bejesus out of me. But yeah, it's so unpredictable and, and lakes can be too, but I just feel like lakes, there, there's a steadiness. Oh, dear. I know it keeps making that sound. Um, I don't know. So it's funny that you say that. Cause I feel like you used to get annoyed at me. I just about remember water. being like, these girls got to get, become better swimmers. Yes, and, and yes. I feel like I was a little bit more. I agree with that. Jacked up or wrong. So anyways, let's, let's jump into okay. the topic. Let's talk about gambling. I woke up this morning to go play pickleball. I checked my podcast feed. 60 Minutes had this thing on um, gambling um, specific to uh, young men. Mm -hmm. And uh, John Duffy wrote a book. We've been in John's world here the last few weeks because we uh, did a conference with him. And I just thought it was a really important topic. And it seems like sometimes you and I don't talk specifically about threats to our children. Sure. And I feel like this is one of those things that I have interest in. And I, I'm a little jaded against gambling. And not to say I don't. I used to play fantasy football and I stopped just because it was taking way too much of my time up. But I do have a few clips from the 60 Minutes that I'd be happy to play at some point. I know you sometimes you get annoyed when I play <laughs> longer clips. But it's um, it's there was some Supreme Court decision. 1992. That I think it was no, I think it was recently, more recent than no. The Supreme Court struck down a 1992 federal okay, law. There you go. But, yeah, in 2018. Like, yeah, 2018. Mm -hmm. And it basically means that we can. It's as if we're at the sports book in Las Vegas. We used to have to get on a plane, go to Vegas to go gamble legally, mm -hmm. and now we all have it. At least if we live in Illinois. On our phone. Yeah. So basically they struck down a 1992 federal law that said you couldn't gamble in this way. And it banned commercial sports uh, betting in most states. Um, but now we can now they left it up to the states, you right. know, so you can, you know, do online betting um, because before now some of the I remember when this conversation was happening in 2018 and a lot of the people who wanted this to be overturned, this federal law, they were saying that betters, people who wanted to bet or gamble were forced into the black market. Mm -hmm. OK, and so they saw that, you know, this offshore wagering operation as a problem. And then it was going offshore. You know, if we're going to bet, it's kind of like the way people thought about marijuana. Right. It's like people are buying it. Yeah. So if it's really not that bad, why don't we? start taxing it yeah. and start like making this a thing that we get money from. Um, and so, you know, play instead of placing a bet with a bookie, people still do that. 
But now not you can, nearly as many. Not you don't have to, right? Right. You know, now you do it on your phone. Um, can I play a clip? Sure. All right, here we go. But survey after survey confirms that of the 50 million or so sports bettors in the U.S., men under the age of 35 are far and away the biggest demographic. For decades, leagues feared gambling would corrupt competition. So far, that crisis hasn't happened. But the last five years have given rise to a surge in young gambling addicts. Joe Rosillo, now 26, says his problem started in high school. Then in 2022, sports betting apps came to his home state of New York. What impact did that have? It had a big impact. I've worked my whole life, so I, you know, I got a check every week, but they would deposit right into whatever app I was using. Were you interested in the game itself? I am a sports fan, but as the years grew on, you become less interested in the game itself and more interested in the result. And who needs a bookie when a fresh bet is just a swipe away? You know, you can wake up in the middle of the night, take your phone out, set an alarm for a match, maybe overseas or something like that. I would place a bet on anything, anywhere, at any time. Boom. Poor yeah. Joe. And it's yeah. so accessible. It and um, I, I might play a clip about, I think they call it micro betting. I forget where you bet about things within a game. Yeah. And it's just, um, it's just a, a thing that I think is really a significant threat. And uh, I might bring up John Duffy's book again, but a few of the problems he sees with our young men is one is obviously porn, one is weed, but he put sports gambling in there as well. And I just think that um, it's designed to be addictive and there's really not that many resources out there. And I, I don't have, you know, we have stories from when we were younger. Yeah, we have I was going to say, I have so many stories. We have friends that got into a lot of trouble. Uh -huh. um, I thankfully didn't, but it, it triggers that part of your brain that it it's the addictive part of your brain and you could just get in a lot of trouble. That's another version of a dopamine rush, another version of doing something that can help you focus just on that thing. You know, like gambling is one of those things that if you are gambling and focusing on betting and winning money, then your attention is there mm -hmm. and you don't have to feel all your feelings. You don't have to deal with what's happening. You get to just focus on this next game or whatever it may be. Well, and when, right. when you and I were in college, I... It's funny because I don't know that at our college betting was as huge as when I moved to Chicago and met a lot of new friends and heard about their schools, bigger universities. There was a huge betting thing. Like I had friends, new guy friends and girlfriends who had bookies. Yeah. And I was like, is that a thing? So at our college did, was there? No, I don't think it was as big at okay. Drake as it was on other college on bigger campuses. campuses. Yeah. Maybe it was going on and we didn't know it, but it just, first of all, I didn't have any money. I know. Um, so it's hard to gamble with money you don't have, but um, I don't know if I'll play it in the clip, but you know, these kids gamble with their loans that they get mm -hmm. from the federal government their financial for aid. school. Yeah. Or they gamble their inheritances of mm -hmm. from wherever. So, you know, when you're when you're if you're addicted to it, you'll get the money from wherever. Just like any other addiction. Yeah, I mean, right. they may also work full time, but then their paycheck goes to, you yeah. know, goes to betting and they're in and, and, and it's really messy because, you know, there was a lot of again from my friends in my 20s who were still gambling. Um, a lot of them would make money, right? And they'd be like, Oh, I'm up fifty thousand or whatever, which when you're that age is an incredible amount of money. Like you're it's overwhelming. But then the problem and like with any addiction or with anything is you keep gambling and then all of a sudden you're underwater again. Well, and we always hear the stories about our friends when they win a bunch of money. Right. Uh, people are not nearly as excited to tell you the stories about how they just lost a bunch of money. And I had friends who dated uh, and, and, and um, I'm speaking of men because I didn't know a lot of women betting. I do now. Mm -hmm. I know women doing online betting, but I didn't know a lot of women who had bookies when I was in my 20s. But I had guy friends who were underwater and owed bookies money and were on the hook. And it was a big with deal physical threatened violence. with violence. Yes. So it's it's one of those things where when you say it out loud, you're like, that can't be real. And it and it's is. Real. It's absolutely real. So two quick things. I um, I picked up Rescuing Our Sons by John Duffy this morning. And there's just a little piece on sports gambling and how our young men are struggling with it. It's interesting because he starts out saying, 
um, you know, through a certain lens, it's really not that bad of a thing. And what mm -hmm. he means by that is it's a vehicle of connection between guys. Uh, they talk a lot about it. There's like, um, it's, it's just, it's a fun thing for guys, for people, people. to do. People, yeah, because women do it. Which is great. Mm -hmm. um, yet it's designed for, um, to, to keep betting. Like they, the, these, House money. these yeah. apps are designed to incentivize and influence you to do it. The one thing he did say in the book, which I thought was interesting, is a lot of the kids in John's offices office say that this is their pathway towards financial security. Right. So they right. they minimize like I don't want to go find a job. I can just gamble. And I'm here to tell you, I don't know a lot of things for certain, but there's like less than one tenth of one percent who can gamble better than the casinos can. And what I mean by that is if you gamble long enough, the odds of you winning are so slim that you're it's it's a system that is built against you. Is this isn't this what day traders do? Uh well, day traders are a little bit different. I mean, there's certainly gambling and day trading mm -hmm. as well, but th these games like blackjack or online betting of the Super Bowl it's designed so that they balance out a certain amount of um, risk and reward. Well, if it, it's Chiefs versus the Niners, mm -hmm. right? And all the all the the house wants to do is make sure there's an equal number of bets on each side, right? Because they get a cut of all of that, correct? Um, and that's not always true. Sometimes casinos do like to hedge certain ways, but um, for these young men and young women who actually gamble and think that this is their pathway towards not having a job, one out of a lot of people will be able to maintain financial security over the long haul by gambling. Well, believing that that is a pathway to financial security is like believing porn is sex and intimacy. Right. It's false. Yeah. And why this is an important conversation, you know, when we're talking about parenting is it's yet another thing to have a conversation with your kid about, not a sit down across from the table conversation, yeah. open conversation about online betting and about its how it's created. I mean, now AI is involved in online betting. So the specificity, the, is that the right way to say it? The specificity, how how like accurate it is as far as making sure they don't lose too much money. Well, and you know, the, it's designed to put them in- Ahead in favor Correct. versus the person who is betting. And they have all these tricks to try to incentivize more and more gambling. The one last piece on the Duffy thing is the one thing John says, and I appreciated this, is the problem is kids have a perception that work is really bad. Like work is hard and work sometimes is hard, mm -hmm. but his invitation is for us parents to not model the drudgery of the day-to-day -day working life experience. So in other words, share some of the good things about what you get out of being employed by a company. Like you get significance, you get notoriety, you get financial security, you have a sense of meaning. Like he's really like play up the idea of the best parts of our job as opposed to just simply complaining about work. Does yeah. That make sense? I mean, yeah, that's, I think that's definitely part of it. I think that that, kids are also not just thinking about when they're going to work. Like, cause we're talking about 16, 17, 18 year olds yeah. who really just want a hit now yeah. of something short where they term, can yeah. short term. Yeah. So yes, I see the big picture in that, you know, in guiding our kids to a place where they go into some kind of world of work that is interesting to them, not just, you know, you're only going to make money if you become a, you know, an accountant, but there's, you know, like a, there's a book I used to use in my college class called Right Brainers, Right Brainers Will Rule the World. Um, is that what it was called? Right Brainers. Let me look it up. Yeah, look it up. It's by Daniel Pink. I don't want to call it the wrong thing, but it's about right brainers and about how the future of work is going to be a more creative endeavor. You know, it's going to be creating jobs and being able to accommodate new kinds of thinking and, you know, like it's not so cut and dry because a lot of the jobs that used to be so cut and dry, we can now, the computers can handle them, yeah. you know? The name so, of the book is Right Brain, A Whole New Mind. A Whole New Mind. Moving okay. from the information age to the conceptual age. Yeah.
So it's not called right brain nurse. Well, you rule the world, but that's basically what I call it because I'm teaching social work. And I basically, yes, I know there's AI therapists out there now. And a lot of the model is, you know, we're going to mess around with this area. But the truth is real connection comes from human connection and a yeah, computer wired towards being with people. Totally. And so we're going to play around with this AI thing. And it'll probably always be out there as far as like a therapeutic model. But I'm telling you, it's connection with people that changes people's brain waves. And so can I play 30 more seconds? Uh, Go ahead, wait, your because thought. you're, you kind of threw a lot out there sure, as babe. far as like understanding why people gamble. And the thing is, is that first of all, it's accessibility and it's silly when it's like, for example, I went to buy some wine. We were in Italy in November and I found this really great Italian wine. And I was like, I can't, it's not in the States. And so I looked it up and I, and they're like, wait, can you go on this website? Are you 21? And I'm like, I am check a box. They're like, okay, come on in. Like you somehow managed to get through it that. It really wasn't too hard. Well now I know some betting, um, some like digital betting, there is a little more like, um, to like authentication, yeah. you know, like you have to give a social security or you, it's a little deeper than that. But again, our kids who are digital natives yeah. can tend to jump over these hoops. They of, can figure it out quicker. Yeah. So a lot of times they're like, no, you can't, you got to be 18 or 21 to gamble. And it's like, well, it's kind of like saying you can't be on Instagram until you're a certain age, but kids much younger are yeah. on. So, and I was reading that a lot of parents involve their kids in their bets. Mm. So kids have access to their parents' account. Yeah. You know, it's like the kid is the bookie, like putting it in or making the choices. And so already... You have a kid and some kids who are 16, once you have your own job, often have their own bank accounts. Yeah. So parents don't always know the money coming in and out, which I'm not a big fan of. Let's oversee everything our kids are doing. It's so funny because I feel like we talked about empathy. Yes. And the spectrum. Uh -huh. Gambling by itself is not a bad thing. Right. You know, it's in a vacuum. It's, oh, you're placing a bet. It's when it's it competition. gets- competition. When it gets too far- when it becomes too much, yeah. you know, too much of anything isn't good. Well, and too much and with a misunderstanding of how it works, yeah. because, you know, to your point, like if somebody's like, oh, you know, if we're playing the game of like, you know, Indecent Proposal or other movies where they're like, I'm going to go bet this one chip and win all my money back. Yeah. It's like, it doesn't work that way. Has it worked that way? Maybe. But a lot of times those people who make a ton of money go back down stairs. I'm talking about like in a casino and then spend that money. Well, so we found that out in Indecent Proposal. Woody Harrelson had a really good night. He was halfway home to paying off his mortgage. And he's like, I figure by, he says something stupid, like by two o'clock tomorrow afternoon, we'll have it all back. And then it was gone. And then it was all gone. Yeah. And and this is like a, you know, this is a, um, a trope or maybe that's not the right word, but it's a plot point a lot of times as far as thinking that betting is going to win us money. And it, and it gets really confusing because there are people like we were just with one of your friends and he just won a ton of money. Yeah. One of my best friend's brothers just won a ton of money with online betting. So it does happen. But there's also this belief that now I have all this money to play with that was never mine. Yeah. And so it's a, and so to your point, like people who have, who are like, I'm going to bet um, you know, five bucks on the game this afternoon. So just to make it interesting and fun. So I actually have someone I want to cheer for. And it's not just about the game. It's about who gets the first kick, who gets the first touchdown. Yeah. The prop bets. Yeah. All those bets. And so that's fun because it's like, it's bringing you into the game, but that, that thing that you just played, the guy's like, I'm not even really, he's like, I'm a sports fan, Yeah, but I'm not really watching the game anymore. Right. I just want the outcome. Right. We used to watch sports because we loved the game. Right. And now we're simply rooting for somebody to get a last minute field goal to cover a spread where it really has nothing to do with the integrity of the competition of who's winning this game. Instead, it's about, am I going to hit my money or not? Exactly. And so then you're kind of missing the whole, because, you know, I think there's a lot of data that says it's brought more people to sports, you know, and I, and again, in that, in the 60 minutes time, there's a funny clip where they're like, some people are watching or not watching. They are betting on like a tennis match. That's like 16th place. No, no, it's, it's neither of the two tennis athletes were in the top hundred. So nobody yeah. would even no, nobody really be concerned about it. Yet they're making it available to bet on because somebody, you know, the more product that they have, uh, the more likely that somebody's going to bet on that product.
And because it's AI, because it's like so easy to figure out who people are and when they bet, they are also getting push notifications that say things like, this is a game you usually bet on, or this is the time of day you usually bet, or here's a sport that you usually bet on. Yeah. So even if you're trying to be like, I'm going to back away from this. They know. They, they know, know your you. preferences. They know what time of the day you usually yep. gamble. They don't. They know what sports you typically bet, yep. what type of bets you usually do. So I want to like just pull back and say, okay, this is a great discussion about gambling. How do we help parents? Let's say yep. that there's somebody out there that has a son or a daughter that they fear is is in the grips of a gambling addiction. Yeah. What do we do? Well, in the grips of a gambling addiction is is big. Yes. That means that you need yeah, therapeutic not, help and yeah. you know and that kind of thing like that. We don't have a simple answer for that. I would say gamblers anonymous. Yeah. Right? Yeah, GA or but What if you're just worried, "Hey, this is getting too too much." Like they're not like fully addicted, but or just that they don't even know their kid. Like I kind of look at it, the bigger picture of like, you may have a kid who's gambling a little bit, or you may have kids who haven't started, but you want to have this conversation. And I feel like it, that that's why I relate it to porn or anything else is it's knowing that it's available and it's something that people do. Yeah. Your kids talking to your kids about that. It's out there is not more, is not going to drive them to it. Like they know it's there, yeah. you know, you guys like, and I'll go back to the parenting thing because I know you want me to answer that. But when Todd and I watch a football game, at least one football game, I remember we started counting how many ads there were oh, yeah. for online gambling. Yeah, right. And like I said, it's all different. Like I said these at the beginning, but Bet MGM, Caesars Sportbook, DraftKings, FanDuel, WinBet. And those are just the ones I wrote down. I'm sure there's plenty others. And so the idea that our kids aren't seeing that while they're watching football and you've got like major stars promoting it. You've well, got them doing advertisements. Well, I think it. it's built into the covers. Now it always has been like, I remember Jimmy, the Greek would be on CBS yes. NFL today or whatever it doing was. Yeah. And he would say, no, take the money line or whatever. Yeah. So it's always been around, but it is that times a thousand. Because now those commentators, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm sure they're getting paid by the, you know, there's like sure. a sense of let's promote it here. Right. And, you know, there's all these podcasts about it and there's sports radio about it. And, yeah. you know, it's interesting because I grew up, my grandparents loved Vegas sure. and they also loved when the riverboats came around in uh, Wisconsin because they lived in Galena. Um, they would go on the riverboats and gamble too. So they, they, they loved to gamble. The interesting thing though, is I grew up with them gambling like penny slots and nickel slots. So they would maybe lose in a day, like... 30 40 dollars which again is still a lot of money if you're like trying to save money but i never saw for growing up with people who gambled because my parents liked it too occasionally sure. like i went to vegas with them um sometimes they would go to the boats my aunt likes to go you know to the casinos like the new hard rock casinos and stuff but and i've seen them win some things but i've also never seen them deplete their savings or something i i've kind of you know, regardless of how you feel about it, I never felt threatened by gambling. That's why it's always subjective. Like back when Michael Jordan was playing basketball, there were news reports coming out saying he had a problem. Right. And the guy was like a multimillionaire. Right. He was betting, whatever, $100,000 on a golf match or something like that. If he lost, he was still fine. Right. So is that really mean that he has a gambling problem? I don't know. I, I think my answer would probably be no. He's, he's not... I think where it gets bad is when you don't have the ability to provide for yourself or your family. Um, but aside from that, I think it's uh, it's harder for me to judge those people. Yeah, and, and it can be difficult sometimes. You know, Todd and I go to Vegas a lot, but then if you also go to the casinos, you know, if there's casinos around you, and sometimes when you see the clientele, you wonder if they have enough money to be doing what they're doing. Is this, we don't know, right? You can't just tell by looking at somebody, but there is a concern often that people are, you know, kind of like, buying lottery tickets that people are blowing the money that they got on Friday to have this kind of like dopamine rush over the weekend. Speaking of lottery tickets. Um, so like, let's say I'm at a gas station. I see somebody with a really broken down car or right. something like that, spending $30 on scratch lottery yeah, tickets. tickets. Yeah. There's in the past, there's been a judgment to me like, Oh my God, do you have, do you have any idea how bad of odds you are to end up ahead in this vehicle of gambling. Right. And then I don't know where I heard it from Daniel Pink or one of the other guys are like, 
there is so much value <laughs> when somebody who doesn't have abundance to at least have, have hope. hope for just yeah. a little bit. Yeah. So it it reset my judgment of it because uh, I happen to be somebody where I, I'm pretty sure I'm always going to have food on the table. And for somebody who's unsure, I would judge them and only to find out that that hope is such a strong motivator and it just made me judge the people a lot less. Yeah, and that to have the joy yeah. of having a $2 or $1 scratch off and to maybe win 5 bucks, 15 bucks or another ticket yeah. is a it it's in itself a joy. Like there it, not everybody. Yes. There is a uh you know, there's billboards about oh, it's up to a billion dollars or yeah. it's up to 5 million. So, yes, we are getting targeted you know, to, to go buy a ticket, you know, they're saying go buy a ticket because you could become a, a billionaire or whatever it is. But we also have all this data around, you know, as soon as somebody wins the lottery, their, their happiness goes down. Yeah. They actually become more depressed yeah. because it doesn't quite fit into the they, lifestyle. They, they have. usually lose most of their money. They yeah. usually lose it or they get ripped off in some roundabout way. Yeah. Someone claims to help them and that ends up stealing from them. There's so many stories. I think there was actually a documentary about lottery winners, but we have this, I mean, Todd, it's so deep because we have this false perception because we live in a capitalistic society that if we have money, we will be happy. Now, there's been plenty of research that debunks that, where we know that there is a certain amount of money that if you get to that level, there is a happiness level that you have, even if you earn more money on top of that. Now, if you're in poverty, and then you earn a certain amount of money, and so you're no longer in you know, there's no longer that, you know, hand to mouth kind of experience. Yes, your happiness level goes up. But beyond that, it really doesn't. Yeah. And so it's this misunderstanding we have about what money does for us, you know, like all the quotes we've heard, you know, the Jim Carrey stuff, I wish everybody had a million dollars. So if they had it, they would understand that's not where it's at, mm -hmm. you know. So it all starts there, right? Because we believe that that money is going to change our lives. Right. Um, I think like the the level, and this is years ago, and we, we did a few podcasts on money and happiness and the balance between the two, but it's something like in this country, if you have whatever, if you make over 55 K a year, your likelihood of being any more happy after that, it doesn't increase. It does not increase. And, and there's all sorts of different research around it. Like some people start at much lower as far as like you know, and all, and isn't happiness relative to, right. because it just depends on your needs, right. you know, where you live. So it is, it, it was, it's interesting because I feel like we've talked about this a lot in our family, but just, I think it was like maybe three or four months ago, Sky came home and in her sociology class, she had learned this about money, that the happiness doesn't go up. You know, she heard the statistic from her teacher and she came home and told us like it was brand new information. Now, you and I were not like, no, we told you that. It's good to have a kid hear things from multiple sources and then it goes in a lot easier. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I always think that with my college students, sometimes they don't buy what I'm selling mm -hmm. as far as here's the researcher, here's what mindfulness does. And they're like, eh, but I always think to myself, if you hear it again and again and again from different resources, then it'll finally, it'll land. finally, it'll finally land. So I just think that, it just depends. Like you and I, our girls know that we love Vegas and we go to Vegas all the time. We are the worst gamblers in the world. And I don't mean that Sweetie, we lose money. You're the worst gambler. I just mean that I will not do it. I will sit with, you and I usually take out like $50, sometimes a hundred. We did a hundred once. Sweetie, I always bring 300 bucks with me. You do? Yeah. But we never do it. No, we don't. Um, we're I, like, we're we, so boring. And <laughs> Back in the old days... I used to have you sit down with me at a yes. blackjack table because yes. at least I understand all the rules. There's right. so many games it's hard to manage. I like blackjack too. You do until you lose a hand right. and then you get all jacked up. <laughs> so now we're, we're, we've pivoted over to the video poker. Table. Yes, that's much Because my, there's my no speed. dealer, there's no social social pressure. Yes, because you screw up other people's cards too. I know. Like as soon as I, I always get nervous and I like you said, I don't do this much anymore, but to go sit down on a table that's already going you screw up the deal you don't screw it up but you change it you do i know you do sweetie but as long as you uh play normally yeah nobody's okay. going to be upset with you true if you're hitting on 17 or right staying on nine then yeah people are going to be like what are you yeah, doing staying on nine but 
<laughs> I should pull up that. I'll but. stay. I'll stay. Um, what about on French? She's like, hit me. Hit, hit me. me. There's so hit many me. movie lines about gambling. I think of Swingers. I think of Friends. Uh-huh. I think of... Rain Man? Rain Man. The Hangover? The Hangover. <laughs> oh, my God. There's so many good ones. We I should just like put all those clips together, but I'm too lazy to do that. Rounders. That was Todd in my first date. I thought Titanic was. No, no. The first you you asked me out on a date mm. and we went to see Rounders. And then like a week later, you gave me a gift. What I give you? Of a VCR cleaner oh, because yeah. my VCR, are we aging ourselves or what? My VCR was getting like kind of wonky. And then I used the VCR cleaner and then you came over and we watched Titanic. Um, yeah. And, but there was always something wrong with the sound. On I know. And it, it never sucked. really worked. Well, I was poor. I didn't have a lot. I mean, let me say that better. I didn't have enough money. People, it's not always nice to say that because I had a job and I was working, but I was also going to school. So I didn't have a lot of money. How about my favorite movie, uh, my favorite um, part of Rounders? You ready? Okay, let's hear it. You've seen half the hand. How the fuck are you betting into us? You sure this is wise, Abe? It's your money the kid's betting with. That's plenty wise. We know what we're holding and we know what you're holding. <laughs> the fuck you know what we all got. Summer clerkship in your office says I know what you're holding. I don't bet with jobs like that. Let's just say I'll put you at the top of the list if you're right. Okay. <clears throat> well, you were looking for that third three, but you forgot that Professor Green folded it on 4th Street, and now you're representing that you have it. Um, the DA made his two pair, but he knows they're no good. Judge Kaplan was trying to squeeze out a diamond flush, but he came up short, and Mr. Eisen is futilely hoping that his queens are going to stand up. So, like I said, the dean's bet is $20. Well, kiss my ass. <laughs> kiss my ass. I love that. That's so theme. great. Me too. Because there are people that in the world yes. who not only understand cards, but can play poker for a living. Yes. There are people that play poker for a living. And we all want to be those people, but we're not. Just like we're all not dancers and we're all not singers. Yes. Like there, and I think some people just have this intuitive sense. They can read people. They know how to, they have a, they have a good idea of risk. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the right way to say it. They have a good tolerance mm -hmm. for risk. Um, and they're, you know, and, and what's his name in Rounders? What's Matt Damon's name? I know Worm is the other guy. Michael. Isn't it Michael? No, it's not Michael. I can't remember. I'll look it up. Yeah, look it up. But talking. he's brilliant and he should be playing cards and I, you know, I don't know if everyone agrees with that after seeing Rounders because he kind of messes up his life. But really, he messes up his life because Worm messes up his Worm life. Worm messes it all up. You know, but it sounds like Worm. Mike, Mike McDermott. Oh. It is Mike. It's Mike. They call him Mikey, though. Yeah. They don't call him Michael. Well, whatever. Um, um, Mikey is a big winner here. That's a different <laughs> movie. <laughs> Who's um, the big winner here? Mikey. Mikey's Mikey. a big winner. Mikey's a big winner. Um, what about a little shot from Teddy KGB? Oh, boy. Give it all by then, then you are mine. What's up with that accent? Sweetie, the Oreo. I know. The, if he, he would open the Oreo and it was like some kind of giveaway with yeah, his cards. That's his tell. Yeah. So it's like, it's like the, the, talking about gambling, it's like anything else. It's like alcohol, right? It's like any addiction. It's it can be fun. Like we can you and I can have fun going to Vegas and fun talking about rounders and maybe placing a bet or doing a bingo game for the Super Bowl and putting some money on it or playing blackjack with friends. But if it if it gets to a point where you believe that this is going to work out for you that this isn't just for fun this is going to be the way you pay for school or this is going to be the way that you find yourself worth or this is going to be the only way you get a dopamine hit um or you're going to use it as a way to avoid your life then it spins out of control one more movie line okay i'm the fucking loser i'm the one that should be sorry we don't talk that way Could we just go please Can we go Baby, look at me. Look at me. Your money. You know what else? You're a big winner tonight. I want to leave. You're a big winner. I'm going to ask you a simple question. I want you to listen to me. Who's the big winner here tonight at the casino? Huh? Mikey. Mikey, that's who. Mikey's the big winner. Mikey wins. Oh my God. Mikey wins. So young. And, you know, so... You asked me like 15 minutes ago, what do we say to parents about this? You have to, this has to be part of your conversation with your kids. Yeah. You know, there, if you do gamble, you have to talk to them about the way you do it 
if you are gambling and you are losing a lot of money and you are not making great choices with gambling, they are watching that. And, you know, with anything, things go one way or the other, either they follow or they completely separate from it, right? There's there's kids who grew up with smokers who became smokers and there's kids who hated smoking so much that they wouldn't, they don't even want to be around it. You me. know, that was you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I totally agree with you. And if there's um, a way for me to encapsulate what Zen parenting has been about these last 13 years, and you've probably said it in different words, just have conversation. Yeah. Weed, porn, gambling, sex. We have to figure out how not to be afraid to have these conversations. Correct. Correct. They're, they're messy. They're open-ended. Sometimes your kids are going to say something that that aren't great. Sometimes you won't have an answer for them. It's an ongoing communication, but we need to add these things that are in our children's generation to the mix. A lot of times we're focused, like for example, in and we still need to talk about drunk driving. Don't get me wrong. We need to talk about it. We need to make sure our kids have DDs. We need to, you know, designated drivers. But for the most part, this generation is really different than our generation. Sure. They, they got the memo. Yeah. You know what I mean? They, as far as uh, the kids around me that I see, not just my own kids, but other people's kids and clients' kids and college kids, they are like, no, there's there's a driver and they have Uber. Yeah. It's a different time. Yeah. So sometimes when we're like, oh, we just really got to focus on this drunk driving. It's like, no, in this generation, there's other things too. There's not bigger threats, but there's different, different threats, threats that we need to address. And to your point, I think this generation is so much better at making sure there's designated driver. I do too. I, I have no science to back that up. There probably is science out there, but you know, we never dealt with that. We always, there's always some idiot who's ready to get behind the wheel drunk. Always. And, and it just didn't have the stigma that it has now. We right. didn't, we did, it was just like cigarettes. You know what I mean? And I know cigarettes are still out there, but people, it, vaping is more, it seems to be more noticeable and common than people smoking regular cigarettes. Yes. It's just things change. Things, you know, you have an organization like Mothers Against Drunk Driving comes along and the perception starts to change right. about doing that. And obviously you see all the stats and people kill people and it's awful. And, you know, the thing about these experiences that our kids are having around porn or around, um, you know, weed or around gambling is they just have easier access to these mm -hmm. things. And so it's it's not the same as our experience. It's not the same. We their their ability to access. So it's not saying, OK, you're never going to have a phone ever again because online gambling is there. That's not going to work because they need to learn how to. You know, they ha they need a phone, um, again, depending on the age of your kids, to be in life. You know what I mean? To, you know, interact with their generation, to have a job, to use GPS. But they also need to understand what gambling, where the money comes from, what it does, why people use it, and why it can't sustain you in well, life. Um, can I pivot? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just want to say thanks to two brand new Team Zen members, Cami from France. Nice. We, I love we, international members. And then uh, Nicole from Rhode Island. Nice. If you don't know what uh, Team Zen is, uh, it's Join the Circle is a Team Zen membership platform. It's an app with Zen Parenting Radio's complete parenting content collection, plus live talks all in one place. We have all these different micro communities. It's 25 bucks. Cancel at any time. So please join us. I don't know when our next... Zen talk is, but it's coming up. So. I think it's, I think we decided it was next week. Next week. So, so can I just share a few stats that sure I wrote it. down? Yeah. Um, so they, they, they're finally doing some research. I actually did some Googling about how many girls and women are gambling now and they don't, I could find nothing. Mm -hmm. I could find things about people, you know, and they're not being gender specific, but it seems to be more uh, boys and men. So for example, in Long Island, they did this research and- did you say Long Island? Long, L-O-N-G, <laughs> sorry, not Long Island. Long Island, teens and people in their early to mid twenties are now the number one demographic calling gambling hotlines. Okay, mm -hmm. that's research that they have. So because if you guys notice in these commercials or these ads for all of these gambling sites, they give you the gambling hotline, yeah. um, the, the GA hotline, um, but- you know, and, and I'm glad people are using it, but it's really the only thing. Sure. 
Um, it says a survey of 16 to 25 year olds found that almost 70% saw at least four gambling ads on social media every week. Um, which obviously they know they're living in a very pro gambling culture. It's, yeah. you know, it's out there. Um, a national survey of 18 to 22 year olds found that 58% of uh, respondents have placed at least one bet this year. Jeez. Um, nearly 70% of college students living on campus tend to be betters. Um, among sports betters pursuing a college degree, a little over 40% have placed bets on their own school's team. OK, so you you go to a, a university that has like a big basketball team or a big football team or whatever. The likelihood of there being bets is mm -hmm. higher. Yeah. That's why they said they're betters. Um, kids. And this is the hard part. This is always the hardest part to hear. But this is why we need to have these conversations. Kids and teens are more likely to develop a gambling disorder than adults. Of course, uh, I will say, give the full research, but we probably know this. Yale explains that 2% to 7% of youths develop a gambling disorder as opposed to about 1% of adults. And this is because their brains are not fully developed. And so they don't have the rational thinking. They don't have the prefrontal cortex. They don't have the life experience. And so they're more likely to make it their go-to. Yes. Um, so anyway... Uh, just a little, just one more thing. Sure. Only 2% of parents think their teen has used an online betting platform. That seems borderline <laughs> ridiculous. So, and in, in, it was much higher with parents of teen boys, T uh, parents of teen boys, 3% thought that their kid had placed an online bet. Parents of teen girls, 0.4%. Hmm. That's why I was looking for information around girls who bet, because I know girls and women who bet. Sure. Okay. So I know it's happening, um, but there doesn't seem to be any conversation about it yet. Well, and I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. It's like, you know, we're in the infancy of this online from our phone, micro betting availability, and it, they're going to keep throwing money at, I think the thing is these gambling sites are going to throw incentives at you that are really um, seductive to jump in. They'll be like, 50 bucks, free money, just place a bet and we'll give you $50. Like, oh, well, then you can't lose, which is great because you can't lose because it's free money. But now all of a sudden you have an account with them. Now all of a sudden right. they can communicate with you. Now all of a sudden they can figure out what your preferences are. And then they start just kind of reeling you in. So, yeah, exactly. And so that everything that Todd just said, that's what our kids need to know. Yeah. They think found you. They're a They're, you are a product. Just like I get targeted on Instagram as soon as I like click on like a sweater or I click on like a pair of shoes and then all of a sudden that place like is coming after me yeah. in every platform. It's the same with online betting. You place one bet and they're going to come after you. Sure. They they are going to target you. And so we can talk to our kids about that, not in a be terrified way, but just a very informational. Do you guys understand that this is how it works? And do you guys understand that when you place a bet, this is, I mean, some kids don't even know it's real money. You know, they're so used to their like video games that they're like, oh, I'm just going to place this bet. And, and this is gambling is real money. And so, you know, it's just a, it's just another avenue. Well, if nothing else, just watch the 60 minute thing. I'll link it on in the show notes. If you want to watch it, if you're like me, you'll ask your kid to watch it and they'll say no. Um, and you know, like even, and again, your kid's not going to like Zen parenting any more than 60 minutes probably, but listening to this with them or just have, listen, you know what Todd does all the time. He'll be like, girls, just listen to this part, you know, just listen to this one part and, you know, hear us talking about, then, you know, these stats. And then listen to them and then they'll say why we're wrong. Right. But now all of a sudden you have a discussion. Correct. It's okay if they come back and say, I don't know anybody who does it or don't worry, I'm not going to do it. At least you're bringing it into the conversation because when they are when they do see it in high school or in college or in their twenties, you know, they will be like, Oh yeah, I heard about this. This yeah. is what I know about it. What, what I think I always hope to do um, is you just want to bring parents, you, everyone listening into the conversation so they can hear your voice too, because they're getting inundated by people who don't care about them. True. So let's bring in a voice that does care about them. And so they have that to play with. Um, are you going away? Yeah. Oh, because I wanted to say one thing about the Grammys. Go ahead, babe. I loved the Grammys. Okay, that's it. Just kidding. 
What else you got? I just wanted to say that part of the reason my daughters love to watch the Grammys with us is because it's their opportunity to know more than us. Because Todd and I are very into movies and we're very into TV. So when we watch Emmys and we watch Oscars and everything, sometimes Todd and I win. Most of the time we win all the competitions of who's going to win. Right. But with the Grammys, we are a little slow as far as music goes. Very slow, sweetie. We're trying. but I am very slow. I am. I think I'm less slow than you. There was one guy on there and I'm not going to name his name, but I said, I'm pretty sure that that's not music. And I said, my God, I feel old right now. <laughs> I know. And so we, I, I feel like I know names, but I don't always know their songs or I haven't heard it on the radio. Or sometimes I just look up the Billboard top 10 and I'm like, how do I not know these songs? Like, it's confusing to me. But last night, the Grammys was like a Gen X dream, yes. right? I was like, that's Tracy Chapman. And she could not look more gorgeous and peaceful and beautiful. I mean, Tracy Chapman last night was incredible. And she sang with Luke Combs. If any of you saw it, they sang um, Fast Car. And let's not overlook the fact that she is a black queer woman and he is a male white country singer. Yeah. And they are singing this song together. And it was really beautiful. And you may say, well, what does that have to do with anything? The song is about belonging. The song is about there's like a human coming together kind of experience. And, and I love that car, that that car, that that song by Tracy Chapman more so. That's just me being a Gen Xer. Um, because we all listened to that in high school. Like I think I was a junior when that song came out. Like it's such an important song for our generation. Um, so that was pretty amazing. Yeah. It's a bad version. Is that from last night? From last night. Okay, it, listen to her voice. It was incredible. It's so bad, though. I mean, I need to find a better one. So as you're finding that, we also had Joni Mitchell singing um, both sides now, which totally made me cry with Brandi Carlisle, who kind of brought her back into the mix. You should read about that sometime. Um, Brandi Carlisle, that wasn't the first time that she sang with Joni Mitchell. Let's just say that she, this summer they she was at a, a festival and this they did the same thing. Annie Lennox was there and sang a Sinead O'Connor song that Prince wrote and Wendy and Lisa were with her from the revolution. So if you know nothing that it, it, most people will understand what I just said, but Annie Lennox sang a Sinead O'Connor song that Prince wrote and Wendy and Lisa from the revolution were accompanying her. Oh, pretty cool. We also had, um, uh, well, I'll just stop there because I loved everybody. I love Billy Joel. We had Billy Joel with a new song. And everyone was so excited and it was so good. And it was so Billy Joel. And we're going to see him this summer with Stevie Nicks, by the way. Yes. Um, and then I loved SZA. I loved, obviously, we were psyched that Taylor won Album of the Year. She is now the only person, only human, to have won Album of the Year four times. Oh. Amazing. We had Dua and Olivia Rodrigo and Fantasia and... Um, just, I just loved it. I'm, I know I'm well, missing and info. Oh, Miley. Wonderful vehicle connection with our kids. Oh, right? I just love it. And so last night was more fun. I, and, and my kids still love, it. I only have one kid now at home watching, but I'm texting with my other girls, you yeah. know, cause they're watching too. And it was just, I felt like it was a Grammys where I felt just as included. Boom. Okay. Love that's it. it. All right. Um, so I want to just give a shout out to, uh, Jeremy Kraft, bald head of beauty, painting and remodeling. Throughout the Chicago area, 630-956-1800. We also have a partner that you heard in the mid-roll, David Serrano, uh, giving a personal financial advisor. So thanks to David. And uh, join Team Zen, for goodness sakes. So long. Keep trucking. Mm -hmm.